Welcome, welcome, welcome to the first event of the Beyond the Holocaust Lecture Series event series for this semester. Uh, an evening of Jewish art and music. We have a feast for the ears, we have a feast for the eyes, and of course, outside, feasting as well. So, fortification for mind and body, which is critical for modern art and modern music. Before I introduce our first speaker, <laughs> Uh, Professor Richard Sun. I do need to recognize those who have helped make this and other events possible. Richard Sun, Michael Lieber, Lana Hackler, and Carla Munyan in particular for this event. Um, and of course tonight's events are made possible by the Legacy Heritage uh, Jewish Studies Project which aims to highlight local Jewish studies resources and help support the development of Jewish studies programs at universities outside of major metropolitan areas like this one. It's directed by the Association for Jewish Studies. Support for the Legacy Heritage Fund Jewish Studies Project is generously provided by the Legacy Heritage Fund Limited. Please join us again on March the 12th for our next event. And if you need to know what the events are going to be, there are cards at the back on the table, and you can just conveniently take one. And it's got the whole list of events for the, for the semester. <clears throat> uh, this will be that that event is going to be UA alum and Duke religion professor Laura Lieber, who will help us rethink the women of the Torah or the Old Testament. And if in between, you have not yet had a chance to go to the library, to the Walton Reading Room, and see our outstanding exhibit curated by <coughs> Catherine Waller, and myself, and Josh Lemba, who is also there he is. Please make sure you get a chance to go over and have a look. It's a fascinating <coughs> array of material. All right. As usual, there are evaluations. Please help us out and fill one out if you can. Tonight's event is a two-parter. The first part will be in here, so we'll, we'll have art, and then we'll have a lecture, and 10 minutes or so of questions, and then you get a little break to look around, to ask questions, to have some more food. And then we transition over to the Multicultural Center for Klezmer Fest. Yes. So, we've got a lot going on. It's all very exciting. My name, by the way, is Jennifer Hoyer, if you haven't yet met me. <laughs> Uh, and I'm a faculty member in the German program, but one of my research areas is German-Jewish literature and history, especially of the 20th century. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Professor Richard Sun, who is a professor of history here at UA. He teaches courses on modern intellectual history, among other things. And his recent book is on display in our exhibit. If you would like to know what it is, why not go over there and have a look? It's extremely exciting. It really is. The cover is really, really exciting. So <laughs> and then, after you see the cover, if you don't want to just go check it out immediately, think first, about it. The first two words in the title are sex and violence. <laughs> see? Now you're, now you're tempted. But, okay. Um, this evening, he's going to talk to us about Jewish modernism, immigrant artists in Montparnasse, from 1905 to 1930. Mine, Adam Lanham, gentlemen and ladies, Richard Sun. <laughs> studios in Montparnasse in the 1920s. 
In the era of surrealism, American jazz, and the cocktail, one could argue that Jewish presence in the arts was equally integral to the Bohemian artistic milieu. Gertrude Stein, herself a Jewish expatriate, dubbed the American writers, composers, and artists who lived in Paris the lost generation. Lost, possibly, but hardly forgotten. It is time to also remember the Jewish artists of Montparnasse. The years of modernism, roughly 1870 to 1940, coincided with mass Jewish immigration from the Russian Empire, from the chaos that engulfed Russia during World War I and the Russian Revolution, and from interwar persecution of Jews in Central Europe. By 1939, the population of Jews in France reached 300,000. The 200,000 who lived in Paris comprised 7% of the urban population, though less than 1% of the population of France as a whole. This compares to the population that numbered 70,000 Jews during the Dreyfus Affair of the late 19th century. Most Jewish immigrants settled on the right bank, especially in the 4th and 11th arrondissement. The most well-known Jewish quarter was in the Marais, along the Rue de Rosiers. Some Yiddish-speaking immigrants arrived in Paris with one phrase they had memorized, Rue de Rosier, Rosebush Street, to get to where they were going from the train station. Yet the hundreds of would-be artists did not settle among their co-religionists, but instead gravitated to the 14th arrondissement on the left bank. Uh, you know, that. So, 14th arrondissement, you can see 14 in Roman numerals, a gray, large gray mass uh, towards the bottom of the map is the 14th arrondissement. It's uh, Montparnasse. Altogether, over 3 million Jews left Eastern Europe from 1881 until the early 1920s. Um, as Jews were liberated from the constraints of Orthodox tradition as well as Tsarist oppression, an enormous cultural and intellectual efflorescence took place, uh, from Budapest, Berlin, Vienna, to London, Paris, New York, and not least, Hollywood. The generation born in the 1880s played a major role in creating not only modernist high culture, but modern popular culture in the 20th century. What appears unique, or at least rare, about the experience of Jews coming to Montparnasse was the confluence of artistic modernism with Bohemia. This combination made of Montparnasse a uniquely cosmopolitan culture. Bohemian values of toleration for difference, and acceptance of deviance, hedonism, sexual freedom, and creativity encouraged an attitude of inclusiveness. Nevertheless, Anglophone and expatriates who found Paris appealing, in part because their pounds or dollars went a long way in the 1920s, um, probably didn't speak French well enough to meet many French artists. Furthermore, while France was awash in American culture, in the decade of lucky liberty in the Charleston and the black jazz clubs of Montmartre, it was not similarly devoted to Jewish culture. In that sense, no one expected the Americans, Canadians, or British to assimilate into French culture. They were expatriates who would when they returned home. Jews were expected to assimilate, and they did so, at least artistically. Uh, but Marc Chagall, so Marc Chagall is not made of Jews. Artist by right. We'll, we'll have to look at the Disney Annie here. I thought I had Chagall here somewhere. I have Chagall somewhere. Um, the most famous Jewish writer artist of Montparnasse retained his Russian Jewish sensibility, the vast majority of his compatriots did not paint scenes of the shtetl. They painted nudes, portraits, and landscapes of any Frenchmen. They did not all paint in the same style as the French. Chaim Soutine's art looked more like that of the German Expressionists. Others, such as the sculptor Jacques Lipschitz, whose work he just saw at Gertrude Stein's head, adopted a more Cubist style. Some, like Chagall, could be called surrealists. Though Chagall never joined with Max Ernst or other surrealists of the 1920s. One of the biggest debates concerning their art is whether they exhibited any particular Jewish qualities in their work, a debate that highlights the fact that such Jewishness was at most implicit. Well, everyone recognizes Marc Chagall from Vitebsk. Amadeo de Liani's Jewish identity is less well known, although there 
He arrived in Paris from Royal Italy in 1906 and headed for Montmartre. Within a year or two, he moved to the left bank as one of the artists most closely associated with Montparnasse. For the next dozen years, Modigliani personified Bohemia. By 1912, Pablo Picasso had followed him to Montparnasse, <clears throat> marking the end of Montmartre's apogee of artistic mecca. Modi, as people call him, embodied the Bohemia of heavy drinking, drugs, and disheveled. <laughs> Modi's reputation as an accursed painter Following the accursed poets Verlaine and Van Gogh, was guaranteed by his early death at 35 in January 1920, and also by the suicide of his eight and a half month pregnant model mistress, Jade Boutin, the day after his death. Even his nickname, Modi, helped capture the myth of the accursed artist, the artiste Modi. There is a good movie about Modi with Andy Garcia playing the artist, which came out in 2004 also a French film dating from 1958, and which highlights Picasso and Dugliani's rival to the title of the greatest Parisian artist of the era. Uh, I suppose Picasso won that contest, um, though he did outlive Modi by half a century after the latter's premature death from tuberculosis, not dissipation as is often applied. Of course, both artists were foreigners, and it was sometimes assumed that Picasso was Jewish as well. In the years following, preceding World War I, Modi was joined by, score, by scores of other aspiring Jewish artists coming from Eastern Europe. There you go, there's Some of these Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazi Jews were very poor, such as Chaim Soutine. Others were not quite so poor, such as Marc Chagall, who arrived in 1911 with a small stipend from a Russian painter. One distinct advantage that foreign artists had over French foreign ones was that they didn't face a military draft in 1914. Some, such as Moise Kisling, volunteered for the French Foreign Legion. The Dugliani volunteered as well, but was rejected for health reasons. Chagall returned to Russia in 1914 to marry his fiancée, and found himself caught for eight years as Russia endured war and revolution. Among Ashkenazi Jewish artists were a number of women, including Sonia Turk, <coughs> a wealthy immigrant who married the French painter Robert de Lanay, and Alice Halika, who married her friend and fellow Jewish <coughs> immigrant, the Cubist Louis Marcusi, and China Orloff, who became a noted sculptor. Work by China Orloff. <coughs> Other Jewish sculptors who became famous were Jacques Lipschitz, you know, Sip Zad King, uh, Lipschitz, um, another one a couple years later, the Walt Hughes style. Um, so Lipschitz and Zad King, both of whom made it to America with the outbreak of World War II, as did Chagall. Uh, many of the poor Jewish immigrants, including Chagall and Soutine, Self-portrait Soutine. Soutine. Uh, set up their studios in La Rouche, or the Beehive, a large collection of cheap studio space on the edge of Montparnasse, near the slaughterhouses of Beaujolais. The proportion of foreign-born artists increased during the war years as Frenchmen were drafted, were further swelled after the war by the enormous influx of artists and writers from all over the world. One estimate was that the quarter's artists comprised 30 to 40 percent foreigners. Others were even higher. Montparnasse became defined by this international community of artists. Marcel Duchamp, who had spent the war years in New York, where he defended Man Ray. That was another picture of the artist uh, that's um, uh, kizzling on the side. Uh, Ilya Ehrenberg, Russian writer. Soutine, and that's Marevna, the artist. I'm going to call the first Cubist female artist. Marcel Duchamp called Montparnasse, quote, the first really international group of artists we've ever had. Because of its internationalism, it was superior to Walmart, Greenwich Village, or Chelsea and even exceeded an important <coughs> old Latin quarter in Paris. 
Duchamp, himself an usually cosmopolitan Frenchman, found this ambience admirable. Man Ray, arrived in Montparnasse in 1921, shed his American Jew Jewish identity as Emmanuel Randinsky, and documented photographically the quarter over the ensuing decade. His model, the longtime mistress, Kiki, was called the Queen of Montparnasse. Unlike Modi, who painted many of his fellow Jewish artists in the war years, Man Ray did not document Jewish life in Montparnasse, which is one of his most famous photographs. <coughs> So internationalism was the predominant characteristic of the interwar artistic avant-garde. Montparnasse proclaimed that artistic genius was transnational, and that Paris was therefore not the center of French, but of global art. This implied that great art transcended local or national boundaries, and that modern art must be experimental, hence unmoored from tradition. In an article in part of the review titled The Fall of Paris, published in 1940, the art critic Harold Rosenberg lamented that, quote, the laboratory of the 20th century has been shut down. Paris represented the international of culture. What Rosenberg failed to realize in 1940 was that in an era of rising nationalism, this assertion of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism inevitably met with fierce opposition from defenders of uniquely French <coughs> or Latin artistic geniuses and from partisans of art that conflict with the local in particular. How much more affronted than would defenders of native traditions be by the presence of hundreds of representatives of the cosmopolitan people par excellence, that is to say, Jews. Conservatives and anti-Semites, such as Maurice Barres, had long used rootless cosmopolitan as a code word for Jews. The wandering Jew legend was hardly new for those people without a homeland, but took on a new meaning after two generations of Jewish migration out of the shtetls of Eastern Europe. Jews were disproportionately likely to live in cities as they were to engage in the liberal professions and in retail trade. They were liberated from residence and employment proscriptions. Jews flocked to Vienna, Berlin, and London, as well as to Paris, and of course, New York, <coughs> after 1870. This sense of liberation from external as well as religious constraints led Jews, after 1870, to take up plastic arts that had been largely, but not entirely, foreign to them earlier. Hostile critics were quick to point out that while Jews had excelled in music and the written word, they had no equivalent expertise in painting or sculpture. And it was commonly asserted that this was due to the second commandment in the Bible prohibiting the making of graven images. There was, in fact, some tradition of Jewish representational art, but it's fair to say that the explosion of Jewish artists born in the late 19th century and coming to maturity around after 1910 was unprecedented. So it seemed extraordinary that Montparnasse should be flooded with hundreds of immigrant Jewish artists. Um, but a generation before, there was precisely one notable Jewish artist working in Paris. Like that. who had come from Martinique, French colony, into uh, Paris in the 1850s. He was a self portrait He did. Jewish artists were being promoted by Jewish dealers and by Jewish critics, who played a significant, even dominant role in the modern French art market. For some French critics, it was easy to assert that the dealers were conspiring to promote Jewish artists in order to enrich their bread. <coughs> Jewish art was not to be understood in terms of creativity, but rather in commercialism, the allegedly well-known Jewish penchant for money making. If promoting Jewish painters had a further effect of Sidelining French artists, so much the better. Some of the hostile critics, most notably Waldemar Georges, but also Louis Vozel and Adolphe Basler, were themselves Jewish immigrants. At best, they demanded that the French, that Jewish artists assimilate and deny that there was anything peculiarly Jewish about their art. Other critics were much worse and proclaimed the incapacity of the Semitic race to produce representational art, especially in contrast with the Hellenistic tradition. It is hardly surprising that there should have been a hostile reaction to appropriation of French tradition in the fine arts by outsiders. It was precisely the Jews and other foreign artists, outsider status, that emboldened them to innovate. No similar animosity was displayed by the Jewish collectors and dealers. Daniela Abreu Kahnweiler, 
Leo and Gertrude Stein, Berta Weil, the brothers Leonce and Paul Rosenberg, George Wildenstein, Leopold Zborowski, Peter Loeb, and others who helped create the market for these artists. Well, by this time you may be wondering what, if anything, we can call uniquely Jewish about the work of these artists. And it's not easy to find a, a, a Jewish essence. Even Chagall found the label Jewish artist to be limited. All were committed to modernism in the sense of experimentation and of freedom from representational realism. Few artists of Jewish origins displayed uh, an explicitly Jewish subject matter. Modigliani painted many portraits of his fellow Jewish artists, which often were not flattering, but expressed the psychological presence of the model. One of his very first portraits, dating from 1908, um, is titled explicitly uh, Portrait of a Jewess. Uh, the poor unknown artist was unlikely to have received a commission from some prominent Jewish patron. Uh, these artists were coming of age at the moment that Sigmund Freud was consolidating psychoanalysis. Vienna. Psychoanalysis was as heterodox as modern art, and Freud a Jewish outsider in the Viennese medical establishment. Some critics see the focus on the human figure as characterizing most Jewish artists in the Ecole de Paris, including Soutine and Modigliani. Not long after arriving in Paris in 1907, Modi noted his psychological preoccupations in a sketchbook, quote, what I am searching for is neither the real nor the unreal, but the subconscious, the mystery of what is instinctive in the human race. For Modigliani, the key to modernism was not a matter of choosing the representation and abstraction, but of penetrating beneath the surface of the subject to reveal hidden depths. This is true of Pinkas Kamenia in his 1925 painting. From 1911 to 1914, Modi saw himself primarily as a sculptor, and like many artists of the time, was strongly influenced by African and Egyptian art. <clears throat> this helped him and other artists to simplify and abstract their work. That style remained evidence when he returned to painting during the last period of his life, when he painted almost entirely portraits and nudes and developed a signature style. So here, and he painted many of his fellow Jewish artists. Here is a kind of a wedding portrait he did of Jacques Anderte Lipschitz, although Jacques Lipschitz did not like this. Portrait of Chaim Soutine. It was a very close neighborhood. They were all very friends. Louise Kisling, mm -hmm. who had a huge reputation in the 20s, has been mostly forgotten since. Max Jacob, the a Jewish-born poet from Brittany, a close friend of Picasso's, the polymer, is a major figure in the artistic the bohemian scene. He nevertheless evolved a distinctive style that has been described as Jewish in its expressive force, its melancholia and negativity, what one critic terms Soutine's shudder. Dr. Albert Barnes was introduced to the works of Soutine by the dealer Zborowski in what every piece he could find, which came to over 50 paintings. I read through Barnes' correspondence last month at his foundation archives outside Philadelphia in Marion and learned that he paid the average of about $30 a uh, canvas for the still unknown, unknown artist. So teen star rose rapidly thereafter. I also read Barnes' enthusiastic letter to the head of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts dated January 22, 1923, in which he calls Soutine, quote, a young Russian now painting in Paris. There are none of his pictures in this country. He is practically unknown even in Europe, and I believe he is a bigger man than Van Gogh. <laughs> well, can't get rid of it, everything. 
Farnsley has, has six Van Goghs in this collection as well, which presumably cost him more than $30 each. Uh, the phrase was weak in the 1920s, and the dollar went a long way. So, Fuchin had a very distinctive, very expressionist style, probably the most expressionist artist working in Paris. And I think that's so excited, Dr. Barnes. He used hands and faces tremendously expressively. Another Jewish artistic trait was expressed by someone who was, perhaps surprisingly, part of the pre-war Montparnasse Jewish milieu, the Mexican artist Diego Rivera. A portrait of him by the Viviani during the World War I. Here's a interesting self-portrait of him very early in the, the Bohemian artist when he first came to Paris in 1907. It doesn't look like Diego Rivera, he probably envisioned as a muralist of the 1930s. Um, so Rivera spent a decade in Paris, so still a, more than a decade, was still a cubist when Modigliani painted his portrait in 1914. Rivera's mother was a converso, a Jew forced to convert to Catholicism. Rivera later wrote that, quote, my Jewishness is the dominant element of my life. From this has come my sympathy with the downtrodden masses which motivates all my work. In Paris, Rivera fathered a daughter by the Russian artist Marevna, who saw it before. He later married Frida Kahlo, whose father was a Hungarian Jew who had emigrated to Mexico. Her work also displays the intense inwardness and psychological searching for, of some of the occult and Jewish artists, albeit from a little bit later period. Kahlo was born in 1907. She came on the scene a little bit later. Chagall, too, painted numerous self portraits. But not as obsessively as Kahlo and dual portraits of himself and his wife Bella, as well as psychological studies such as the Greek and Jew. So this is his self-portrait with seven fingers, which comes from the Yiddish saying. He's like, with seven fingers, he's doing very well. Very, uh, very free of the nest. So, uh, 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 got, they got married that year back in Russia. So this is a dual portrait of himself and his wife Bella. Married to it over again in 1944 in America. Another contemporary figure, the Jewish mystic Gershom Sholem, highlights the humanitarian as well as the psychological aspect of Jewish culture. Quote, Judaism has always maintained the concept of redemption, well, I'm sure of, this, of redemption as an event which takes place publicly on the stage of history and within the community. It is an occurrence which takes place in the visible world and which cannot be considered apart from such a visible appearance. Like Modigliani shows <coughs> that the, the visible and in invisible surface and depth. This is a great, great painting of Chagall painted around the time of Kristallnacht. Seen as being a harbinger of the Holocaust. He's a wandering, a wandering Jew, but uh, the Jewish Christ of the Talus. The Jewish artist best known to pre-war Parisians is probably Jules Pasquin. Born Julius Mordecai Pincus in Bulgaria, uh, many of them gallicized their names when they came to France. Pasquin arrived in Paris at the age of 20 in 1905 by way of Munich. Like with Liliani, Pasquin was a Sephardic Jew, descendant of the Jews who fled the Spanish Inquisition after 1492. Several of his works were shown at the Armory Exhibition in 1913, which first exposed America to European modernism. It is impossible to imagine Pascal painting scenes from his bulk and childhood, as Chagall would do of the Tepsk. Like the Luz Lautrec, Pascal reveled in portraying the vice and the tragedy he saw around him in a detached, amoral manner. So, uh, some examples. This is his wife, that doesn't depraved her. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, he's lots of portraits, 
quite a few news. In 1914, as Europe descended into war, Pasquin crossed the English Channel and caught the first available boat to the United States. He became a U.S. citizen in 1920, just before returning to France. Uh, he is saying he remained in America, hardly captured Pasquin's insatiable nomadism. He traveled all around the United States as well as to Cuba. Here's I guess it's the top of the scenes he made. Back in France, he traveled to Spain, Portugal, North Africa. Andre Morneau called Pascal, quote, the last incarnation of the wandering Jew, end quote, as well as a libertine in the old regime sense. In 1914, as he was heading west to explore new lands, Marc Chagall headed east, first to Berlin for the one man show that Harry Von Walden was putting on his work at, at the Tischstern Gallery, then on to Russia to attend the wedding of his sister and pursue his own romantic interests. With his fiancée Bella. Pascal stayed in America for six relatively carefree years. Chagall spent eight tumultuous years in the East and experienced war, revolution, and the dissolution of the Pale of Settlement. While both artists were back in Paris by the 1920s, the trajectory of their lives couldn't have been more different and perhaps led to divergent fates. The restless Pascal died by his own hand in 1930, feeling aged and used up at 45. Chigal survived to nearly 100 and lived his final three decades in Provence, painting until the day he died. And uh, so an example, a very famous example, I in the Village. And these are this is one of the famous pre-war Chagall's from about 1911. He came to Paris in 1911, so these are the first paintings he did evoking the, the village atmosphere of his native uh, Belarus, in the pale settlement. And then his uh, joy of being in Paris and then evolving this very surreal style, which uh, amazed people like Apollinaire, who made the Pissarro, the, the Pissarro of modernism, because this is surrealism a decade before the Surrealists so did this totally no other influence on their crowd. As assimilated as Pascal was, he was buried in the Orthodox Jewish service. Many of his fellow Jewish artists attended, as they had from Diliani's funeral a decade earlier. Is there anything identifiably Jewish about Pascal's work which doesn't have these very clear, well, clear references like this? The Marshigal. <clears throat> Let me raise a parallel example of Jewish artistic assimilation. The Jewish American composers Irving Berlin, George Gershwin, and Aaron Copeland belong to the same generation as Pascal and Soutine. Irving Berlin, or an Israel Bailey, in Russia in 1888, wrote Alexander's Ragtime Band, 1911, and even more remarkably, White Christmas. <laughs> Gershwin wrote the African-American opera Porgy and Bess. Copeland wrote Rodeo and Appalachian Spring, based on American folk tunes. Most of the Jewish artists of Montparnasse were not devout and were determined to succeed at the Frenchman's own game. Pascal painted nudes that violated religious Jewish tenets, in part to prove that Jews engaged in representational art as well as any Frenchman. The Jewish artists of Montparnasse were not as dominant in the field as with the Jewish composers of Tin Pan Alley, but they did succeed in an alien culture, thereby overturning stereotypes about Jews' alleged lack of a tradition or talent in visual art. Most immigrants congregate in homogeneous neighborhoods where they can speak their own language, find jobs, with immigrants who arrive earlier and preserve familiar traces of their previous lives. Jews from Eastern Europe were confined to one particular region, the Pale of Settlement, and were not allowed to live in St. Petersburg or Moscow. Chagall's lack of a residence permit for St. Petersburg was one factor leading him to take a four-day trip by train from St. Petersburg to Paris. One can only imagine the contrast between life in the Pale and life in Montparnasse. <laughs> 
surely much greater than that between Russia and the Jewish quarter of the Marais. All of the Jewish artists chose Cosmopolitan Montparnasse over the more insular Marais. All the Jewish artists um, should all have been unique in portraying the wandering Jew in his art, which he did as early as 1914. They all have experienced the movement of Jews across Europe and the strange new life that awaited them in the West, in France, in Paris, in Bohemia. Chagall completed the earliest version of his memoirs while still in Moscow in 1922, about to re-embark for the West after the difficult years of war and revolution. He concluded this memoir by looking forward to getting reacquainted with his old friends from pre-war Montparnasse, the Swiss poet Blaise Sondrar, the French cubist Albert Glides, and the Spanish painter Pablo Picasso. Quote, For five years, fountains have been gushing in our souls. I grew thin. I even want to eat. I want to see you, Glides, Sondrar, magician Picasso. I am tired. I will come with wife and child. I will spread like a river among you. Europe will love me and perhaps Russia too. My Russia. In 1922, Marc Chagall left Soviet Russia forever, bound for Paris, along with the Swiss, the Frenchman, the Spaniard, and many of his fellow Jews. 